Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine, and thank you for listening to the Captain's Collective Podcast. In today's podcast, we sit down with Tommy Caloris of Finn and Fowl, Florida, out of Tarpon Springs. After hearing that Tommy spent the season guiding waterfowl with Prairie Rock Outfitters, I was excited to sit down and discuss some of the similarities and carryovers that he experienced from going from a skiff to a duck blind. In this conversation, we discuss his history, the importance of practice, helping clients with their nerves, and why it's important to shut up and listen to older mentors. Of course, we also discuss some food. Tommy's family has been in the Greek food business for generations, and Tommy shared a pretty awesome recipe for shrimp on the Traeger, as well as how to make a great, authentic Greek salad. Thank you for your support. I hope that you enjoy. This is the Captain's Collective. I'll say it's anything you choose, I think it picks you. You know, it's genetic. And Hank said, you won. I grabbed my dad by his face and kissed him on the mouth. And you, I couldn't have smiled harder. My lips were past my ears. If you have a fly rod in your hand, it's this tool that takes you to beautiful places. You meet hopefully wonderful people. And it's just this cherry on top of this outdoor adventure. When the fish is coming, that shot within a shot, that timer starts. Beep, 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 Correct. So what Grandpa and Dad would tell me is like, all right, where's the old big trout laying out there? Where's his shaving cream on the water? Where's he been shaving this morning? I said, look for his shaving cream on the water. And that's where he's going to be. All right. Hey, Tommy, thanks for stopping by and hanging out with us today. I'm excited to hear about your waterfowl season. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I just uh, actually just arrived from western Nebraska. Just drove uh, 20-something hours to get here. So. Yeah. Will you go ahead and tell me a little bit about what you were doing up in Nebraska? Sure. Um, I worked for a, uh, just for waterfowl season, um, I worked for Prairie Rock Outfitters um, in western Nebraska. Uh, they're located in Broadwater uh, on the North Platte River. Uh, primarily they, I believe this is their second or third waterfowl season guiding mm-hmm. people. Um, they primarily were just doing mule deer hunts, turkey hunts, and then they kind of got into the waterfowl game two or three years ago. Um, you know, and really charged at it and they're full steam ahead now. What's like the average day look like when you're guiding waterfowl up there? Cold. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's really cold. Um, it is a, it's a wild, incredible place. Um, the best way I can describe it is it's just, it's natural. Um, you know, so much of the waterfowling that's done in the United States on private ground, um, you know, is, you know, people are controlling their water, they're controlling their crops. The North Platte River corridor is totally wild. Um, you know, the only thing that really man is influencing is the agricultural fields around the North Platte mm-hmm. River, the North Platte River, which is, you know, it creates an incredible food habitat for birds. Um, Mm -hmm. Other than that, the river itself is untouched. Um, It's very natural. So coming there, clients will get an experience of what true wild, you know, duck honey is like. It's Mm -hmm. not, we're not going to a flooded cornfield. Um, We're not hunting and and I'm not taking anything away from the people that do that. I think Mm -hmm. it's incredible that people actually manage waterfowl like that. It's a, it's a, it's an art, it's a talent. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is just a different experience. Um, a typical day there, um, is that what you asked me? Yeah. 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 I just want to walk through a a walkthrough of a typical day at Prairie Rock for um, the guide, for the guide. Uh, you're up at three 30, four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and you are loading everything you need for the day's work, your decoys, food, everything that you'll need for clients, go to the lodge, pick your clients up, uh, predetermine where you're going to be hunting already from the night before. Um, you know, like I said, it's very cold. Um, go out to your blind, throw out anywhere from four to 12 dozen decoys, depending on where we're hunting. Um, typically we're hunting small water. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I say small water, it can be anywhere from a, a Creek that's 20 yards wide to 10 yards wide. Mm-hmm. Um, and you will see, you know, and it, it's duck hunting. I mean, there's days where it's not as good as any other day. So there's days you'll see hundreds of thousands of birds. Mm-hmm. I mean, geese, mallards, pintails, widgeons, teal. Um, it's a very diverse, um, you know, flyway. You see, 
you'll see everything. Um, you know, in a typical day, you'd want to you'd want to have everybody smiling and limited out by ten o'clock, and we're taking mm-hmm. pictures and going back to the lodge. But some days it doesn't work like that. Um, you know, the owners of Prairie Rock Outfitters, Ryan Livingston and Jake Latondras, they're very um, they're very concerned. I wouldn't say concerned, but they they take they take uh, measures to keep the birds, you know, in a relaxed state. We won't ride a hole all day for eight hours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we'll let the birds, if, if we know there's an area that the birds are using, we really won't go in there. Mm-hmm. We'll leave them alone. Um, we never hunt the same hole twice. Um, yeah. And it's just, it's an incredible place, man. I mean, it, it, it was an incredible experience. This was my first season, uh, guiding full time as a waterfowl guide. And I mean, I saw things that I did things that I had never dreamed about doing, you know, it was just, I, I don't know any other way to explain it. It was just, it was incredible. It was a wild, yeah. wild experience coming, born and raised in Florida. And, you know, I, I've hunted in Nebraska my whole life. I have family out there, but you know, it was always on a week or a two week basis, you know, going out there for fun hunting, um, I've duck, deer and duck hunted out there, but you know, to go out there and do that, that was just a dream come true. So. And, and I have a lot of questions about that that we'll get into sure, here in a sure, moment. Sure. Um, but before we dive too much into that, I'd love just to get the background of how you got into the outdoors. And then I know you're a third generation guide and yep. just kind of tell me some of your family history. Where, where are you living? Where are you running your business? All that. Sure. Um, I was born and raised in Tarpon Springs, Florida, on the West coast of Florida, just outside of Tampa. Um, my, I would say my entire childhood, pretty much I was raised hunting and fishing. Um, any, you know, BB gun in my hand, shooting squirrels when I was a kid. Uh, I think don't quote me on this, but I want to say my first real hunt, I was probably four or five years old with my father and we went on a turkey hunt. And for whatever reason, it's very vivid to me, even at that age, um, where we were, where we were sitting, what we saw, you know, for a, for a four or five year old boy to remember those things that, you know, that impacted me obviously. Um, and then the older I got, the more I just kind of took to it. And, you know, it was like we were talking about earlier, my father, he exposed me, my father and my grandfather, they exposed me to a lot of different things Mm -hmm. in the outdoors and they kind of just let me figure out my own way. And I enjoy all aspects of it. I enjoy turkey hunting, hog hunting, deer hunting, Mm -hmm. you know, duck hunting, and fishing alike too. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, growing up on the water, I obviously fished more than I did hunted, but you know, hunting was there. Um, it was always there. Um, but fishing definitely was, was more of a priority when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, like a normal kid would just fishing on the weekends and kind of obsessed with it. The more my life went on, I got more and more obsessed with it. Um, and then I would say probably around, Oh, I don't know. I think I was probably 16 or 17. I, I got introduced to fly fishing. Um, it was by one of my uncles who was from South Florida, um, really big into fly fishing at the time. Um, he came to Homosassa to go tarpon fishing with somebody and Mm -hmm. me living only an hour away from Homosassa. He obviously called me and he said, Hey, why don't you come tarpon fishing with me? I didn't, I'd never fly fished before. I think maybe when I was a kid, they had me throw a flyer out a few times in a bass pond or something. And, um, we went with captain Mike Locklear. That's who he Mm -hmm. got. He chartered. It was him and one of his business partners. And, um, I was literally just a spectator. You know, I had tarpon fish down in Boca Grande my whole life and Mm -hmm. all spinning gear. And, you know, I was fanatical about that. How many can we jump in a day? You know, how can we catch them today? All that. So I went up there and that was just a different, it was kind of slowed down, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, there was no live bait. Like I said, I was kind of a spectator. Um, (laughs) And I really didn't understand the obsession about it, what was great about it. So we're sitting there staked out for having lunch one day and I'm up on the bow and I got my, my uncle's fly rod in my hand. And he said, here comes a fish right here at 11, go ahead and throw at him. And I wasn't a great caster by any means. And I got to fly in front of the fish and he ate, he literally ate it like five feet from the boat. And from that moment on, I turned around and I was like, I have to do that over Mm -hmm. and over and over again. Like that literally that that split second i was like i and i, I missed him obviously i, I you know i trout said <laughs> trout it, and that was it. the end of it um but from that moment on like i i knew that there was something there like that lit a really big fire in me mm-hmm. and 
I, I wouldn't say that I put fly fishing down for a long time, but I didn't have any friends that were into it. And there was really no way for me to be exposed to it anymore. I had a mm. bay boat at the time. All my friends had bay boats and like, you know, like I said, we were tarpon fishing a book of grand and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say I got bored with inshore bay fishing, but I got to the point to where I just wanted to try some different stuff. And I picked up a fly rod and I, I just, I don't know. I just started every time I went fishing, it was like, how can I catch these fish on fly? Whether it was trout, tarpon, snook, whatever it was, I wanted to try and catch them on fly. And mm -hmm. it just, it took me from there and here I am. And you had mentioned to me that you did some time like working a sport fishing boat. Yeah. So, um, back up real quick. You know, whenever it seemed like throughout my my outdoor, I don't want to call it my career at that age. It wasn't a career. It was just me having fun. My obsession, mm -hmm. I guess. When I discovered something, I wanted to do it to the to the maximum. Mm -hmm. I wanted to to you know outwork everybody. I wanted to try and like get the best experience possible out of that. Mm -hmm. It was never about like catching the biggest or catching the most, but it was just getting the best experience of that. So. I discovered sport fishing, you know, I had a buddy who had a, had a boat over on the uh, East coast and he took it to Mexico. Mm -hmm. He invited me to go sail fishing with him. And, um, I caught my, I think it was my second or third sailfish I've ever caught down there. And it, I, I met the mate and the captain and I was like, you guys get paid to do this. Like mm -hmm. you guys travel around the world and get paid to do this. And he's like, yeah, you know, so I come back and obviously on the West coast of Florida, there's not a lot of sport fishing boats like there is in West Palm or Fort Lauderdale or anywhere on the East coast for that matter. Um, but there was one sport fishing boat in Tarpon Springs and I literally went down to the dock and I begged and begged and begged for a job. Finally, they gave me a job and I spent the better part of 10 to 12 years, um, traveling with I worked for two different guys, but really it was for one guy. Mm -hmm. um, we traveled all over the place. We traveled to Bermuda, Costa Rica, the Bahamas, the Turks and Caicos, uh, up and down the entire eastern seaboard, um, fishing in a lot of different tournaments. Um, we did the golf. We would always do the golf. We did all the all the golf tournaments, Emerald mm -hmm. Coast and uh, Cajun Canyons. Um, and it was great. Um, I saw a lot of different things. I experienced a lot of different things that I would have never, ever, ever dreamed of. Um, and it was a blessing and I loved every minute of it, but the older I got, you know, and, and while doing that, I never left my roots. I was always at home when we weren't traveling and I was still flats fishing and fly fishing. And it was, that was my true passion. You know, I bill fish, I enjoyed it, but I, it never lit a fire like it did, you mm -hmm. know, in shore fishing. Um, it just got to the point to where I, I, I just didn't want to travel like that anymore. I yeah. mean, we were traveling four to six months out of the year chopped up, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it ended up being close to four to six months out of the year. And, and, and I don't, I don't frown upon anybody that does it. I think it's a hell of an industry. And I think everybody that does it, they, they go hard and every, every tournament that these guys win that you see in the golf, like Jason Buck on the done deal, all those guys, mm -hmm. they, they fish hard, man. Like those guys are good. They work really hard at what they do and they deserve everything that they get, but it just wasn't for me anymore. So, uh, you know, I parted ways and I've been full-time guiding ever since, man. Yeah. Um, in shore fishing and, you know, just kind of starting to tap into the hunting thing. Mm-hmm. And, and you were saying you're like a third generation guide. What, what's well, not a guide. No, just third generation Floridian. Floridian. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. and, and has your family always been from kind of that central Florida area? Yeah. So my great grandfather, uh, came over from Greece through Ellis Island, um, moved to Tampa. This is probably 1910, um, opened a grocery store in Tampa and, um, didn't work out. Uh, then he went to the war. And he was actually a cook for General Pershing. Hmm. Um, and that's where he learned how to cook. Um, came back to Florida, had a family, moved to Tarpon Springs, opened a restaurant, which was Paps's restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, from 1925 until, oh man, I think it was 1975, they ran out of a smaller style restaurant on the Sponge Docks in Tarpon Springs there. And mm -hmm. then they built a a 750 seat restaurant, um, on the docks. Mm. And my family continued to run that 
till maybe 2002, I think it was. And my uncle, then we sold the big restaurant. And then one of my uncles now, he, uh, he still does, has a couple sandwich shops around the Tampa Bay area. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I was, when we were talking before, I was kind of intrigued by that too, because in a way too, there's a lot of hospitality that comes with the food industry. Oh yeah. And that's obviously the same thing with guiding. Oh yeah. And you got to be a people person. Did you have to work in the food industry a little bit growing up? Or? Um, it was kind of just like, there wasn't any formal, like your, this is your position. You know, I was a kid, so it was more just like get in there and, you know, yeah, do this or do that. There was, you know, I was always too young to really have like a formal mm-hmm. job in the restaurant. You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah, they have like a five year old, like, okay, come on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. which was, it would have been acceptable. What are we drinking tonight, ladies? Yeah. Like my family, <laughs> you know, considering my family, that would have totally been normal. It would have been like, Hey, he's, you're seven years old. You're going to go bus tables and run food now. But no, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't like that. So, we were all in the restaurant, but nobody had like a job or anything. Yeah. So one of the things that I was kind of talking to you about is, you know, coming, it, it, we're obviously right now recording towards the end of duck season. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, my dad just got back off the sure. road from a duck trip. Sure. And, um, I didn't get to make that trip this year cause I, I just have a, a new baby girl. Mm-hmm. Um, congratulations. By yeah. The thank way. you. And, uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting is, I don't meet, I haven't met very many people outside of some of the guys down at FOE, which is mm-hmm. mutual friends there and mm-hmm. stuff and great guys down there yeah. uh, that do fishing and then they switch it up and just sure. go hunt. Sure. And I was curious kind of what was your draw towards investigating, kind of going and checking out this, this duck hunting side of things. Yeah. So, you know, fishing, as you know, and I'm sure you've talked to a lot of guides about it, it'll burn you out. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially with tarpon season, um, you know, In Florida, you know, we start fishing in the springtime and, you know, you roll tarpon season in there. Next thing you know, you've been fishing straight for eight or nine months Mm -hmm. and it'll burn you out pretty bad. And I see, I have seen a lot of guides that are great fishermen and great people, but, you know, great people, people persons, I guess Mm -hmm. is that a word? (laughs) Um, Their business tank because they get burnt out on, you know, being around people every day, day in and day out. Um, so the draw for me there was, I want to hunt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I definitely want to hunt in hunting season. You know, I, fishing's good in the winter time. I can go trout fishing, red fishing every day, but I want to hunt. So how can I do this and make money, but I don't want to burn myself out on fishing. So, you know, I always knew there was opportunity there to, you know, guide waterfowl in the hunting season, or, mm-hmm. you know, I could come up here and be a quail guide or whatever I needed to be. I just didn't know what Avenue to take. And, you know, with the whole Prairie Rock thing, the way that worked out, it just, it was, it was literally like a godsend almost, man. Mm-hmm. It was like, I was supposed to be there. That was the best way to describe it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, that was why, you know, that was the draw to that. It, it gave me a break from fishing. This is, like I said, this is the first year I've really done that full time in the winter time. Yeah. And it's, it's given me a break from fishing. Like I'm, you know, like I said, I just drove here from Nebraska today and like, I'm, I'm ready to go home and like get to fishing. Like I'm, I'm fired up about fishing season now. Yeah. And that was like, when we were on the phone, when we first kind of started talking about recording sure. this podcast, that was what I guess really drew me in was, cause I know that you had been listening to the podcast a while and mm-hmm. we kind of interacted before, sure. but then it's like, when I found out about the, the duck hunting thing, I was just super intrigued. And so I have a, a kind of little list of questions with, sure. with that. My first one is, you know, going from tarpon fishing and uh, guiding in Florida and the hospitality side of things. And mm-hmm. then you go up and you guide your first year in mm-hmm. waterfowl. What, it, what was like the biggest like similarity between the two? Oh, between the tarp, between like guiding fishing and yeah. guiding ducks. I would say the biggest similarity there would have to be, you know, getting people to calm down. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, with tarpon fishing, you know, whether it's the same client that I had from last year or it's a new person on the bow, I don't mm-hmm. care what it is. When the first fish swims down the beach and I say, okay, here comes one or here comes a string, you can tell they're nervous. And it, it that was, that was similar in, mm-hmm. in, in guiding ducks. You know, you get in the blind, it's dark, you know, you're picking these people up at four thirty, five 5 o'clock in the morning that you're driving them down a dirt road at 50 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They don't really know what's going on. You throw them in a pit blind, it's zero degrees out. And then, you know, here come the first group of birds and you can tell that everybody's kind of like jacked up. I'm jacked up too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And they're probably feeding off my energy and whoever else is in the blind guiding with me. 
I would say that's the similarity. The first couple of volleys of birds, you can tell. Sometimes, I mean, people jump up and they miss every single bird. I'm mm-hmm. talking about four or five guns coming out of a blind and not hitting one. And I get it, man. I mean, you, like like I said, we hunt small water out there. Mm-hmm. It's in your face. I mean, there's ducks landing at five yards sometimes. And that can be a lot for people that, you know, have duck hunted but haven't duck hunted in that kind of scenario. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it still fires me up too. Yeah, so. there's a lot of room around a duck. You know? Yeah, there's a lot of error there. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, there's a lot of room for error. So I, I killed my first deer in outside of Tampa mm-hmm. um, in like some land uh, that's the Wiregrass area, oh, if yeah. you know that. Yeah, I'm familiar with and, it. And uh, I was probably just shy of 10. I was probably like 8 or 9. Yeah. So I go out and, you know, some deer come out, and I shoot my first deer. Mm-hmm. And me and my dad start to kind of follow the blood trail. Sure. Deer pops up. My dad shoots it right in the back of the head, falls down. That's my first deer. Great memory, too, for me. Sure. In, in my life, like, I love that memory. That's no burned into your mind, I love right? it. Yeah, it's like, oh, my dad, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so we go back to, to the house where uh, Wiregrass is, the, the guy who his family owned the land, and he had all these deer on the wall. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was, you know, like I said, eight or nine or whatever. So I, I see one of these big deer on the wall, and I go, oh, man. I said, how many... Uh, how many shots it take you to kill that one? Yeah. You're thinking <laughs> in your mind, like he had that to shoot was that normal, 10 yeah, times, yeah, right? Know, I don't know. I don't know. Who knows what I was thinking at that right. age. And he goes, one, why waste the bullet? Yeah. And, uh, and my dad had asked him once the same guy that was real clever. He had asked him, you know, he had this old gun. This guy's, you know, has tons of money, but just cho- chose to hunt with the same rifle for the mm-hmm. majority of his life. And he goes, Wiregrass, if that gun could talk, what do you think it would say? And he'd said, there's a lot of room around a deer. Yeah. And when you go waterfowl hunting oh, man. and like, you know, uh, and you just start, you, you just think that, you know, I could just get, if I could just get it around this duck, you know, I'll hit but no, there's a no, lot of room around. There's a lot that, of room. That makes a ton of sense with some of the similarities about getting excited. How do you, like, what would you try to do to calm somebody down? Is there anything as a guide that you think you can do that? You, you know, somehow? it's different um slip some booze in their coffee or something shot of brandy or something it's 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 a little different because you know for me you know tarpon fishing when i'm on the back of the boat pushing somebody and i'm watching them getting fired up and you know whether they trout set or they just totally fall apart when they're casting they don't even get the fly there Mm -hmm. like if I if if they know they're jacked up and they're in good spirits about it, I'll kind of let them just figure it out on their own. Mm-hmm. And you know, but if it's if it's ruining their day and I can tell that they're getting really frustrated, like we'll stop, let's slow it down, let's back up. Um, you know, come if if it's a casting thing, let's back up and let's figure out where your cast is wrong or like mm-hmm. what can I do, what can I do with the boat to help you you know, present the fly better, whatever Mm -hmm. it might be. So with duck hunting, with duck hunting, like I, I, you know, it's kind of out of my hands. Like I don't, you know, they got the shotgun in their hands. So, you know, when, when I I or Jake says, go ahead and shoot them guys and they pop up and it's boom, 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 boom. And there's Mm -hmm. no ducks falling. Like (laughs) typically everybody's just laughing at that point. You know what I mean? Like nobody, it's different. Nobody's really getting frustrated when they're missing ducks because they know that it's like, wow, this is so stupid. How did I miss that duck at 15 yards? But in reality, if they slowed down and tried to figure out what they were doing wrong, they probably didn't even put their face on the gun or to their shoulder. You for try that to matter. coach them on that. I mean, do you have to? Give yeah, them I mean, like- after a while, you know, I, I heard Jake do it a few times this year. Like, hey, guys, remember to aim, like put your face on the gun, like really bear down on your first shot. Yeah. And then eventually towards the end of the day, like they start shooting them. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that show up that are just flat sharpshooters. I mean, we were hunting with a guy the other day. It was 81 or 82 years old. And what did they call him? Dead Eye Ted or something like that. The guy literally, like, I've never seen somebody shoot like that. I mean, he was hitting ducks. You know, they're coming by on their first pass, and they're getting ready to make another pass at us. And as they're swinging out to make their next pass, he's popping up and shooting them at 60 yards. It was pretty incredible. Yeah. Like, it blew my mind, honestly. Yeah. You know, one of the issues I had when I was a kid and I first started duck hunting and I told you I grew up, uh, like I spent middle school, high school near a pretty good lake here Mm -hmm. in in the panhandle Mm -hmm. and, uh, was I would shoot into the flock. So like, you know, a group of like not pick one ring would come in and I would just 
shoot into the the flock of them and you and would expect I like to, you don't expect all of them to fall right yeah, never actually occasionally sometimes one would fall and you'd be <laughs> yeah. like yeah i shot that one that you me. know that was me yeah i was totally right. aiming for that one right you know? uh and it's funny because like you know i i first started duck hunting before i started tarpon fishing as far as like mm-hmm. the sight fishing side and everything mm-hmm. and it's kind of a similar thing if you have like a big string come in it's like very need to very very like, don't very just, like, throw it out there yeah. now i know like you're talking about the trout set everyone kind of has their achilles heel sure my heel uh is to like over to lead oh yeah so <laughs> That's a, that's a big one. I'll like I'll like like cast like way in front of them. And then they like, change. What are you like? Yeah. yeah what are They'll you change doing? their line or you, you know, know fish bumps out but, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then it's kind of ironic because of course like most people when they're trying to shoot ducks they they, they under they don't lead them enough. You know so. they don't lead them enough. They stop the gun or you know a big one is is like you know primarily we're shooting greenheads out there. Mm-hmm. Well, when it's a big bright sunny day and you get let's just say four birds come in and two of them are drakes and there's three or four guys shooting. I mean, a, a, a big white duck with a bright green head in the sunshine, everybody's aiming for that bird. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So some, I shot that bird. Yeah, that was me. I, I shot that bird. Or like, you can tell that everybody's aiming for that duck because when he dies, it's like boom, 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 boom. And he just, it, it, it pillows them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's, it, it'll be, it's like, well, what about the other three? Why didn't you guys shoot the other three? You know what I mean? Yeah. So when it, I, when I hunt with those guys up in Tennessee, they'll do like the thing where they'll be like, Hunter, you got it. Yeah. And then it'll be like, I hate that, man. Yeah. I freaking hate that. Yeah. Cause that's like, that's you right there. Yeah. Like everyone else is sitting there. You've been, maybe you've been waiting for 30 minutes. <clears throat> Finally, a duck comes in. Sure. And it's like, all right, Tommy, you're up. Yeah. You know? And it's kind of like, it's kind of reminds me of fishing because yeah. it's like, you know, let's say that you're, you're guiding and you, you know, we'll, we'll keep it in the fly fishing thing. Cause mm-hmm. I don't know anything about bill fishing yet. Yeah. I do want to interview bill fishing. Sure, guides. man. Um, but, it, and it's like, you're up there, you're casting. So yeah, it's like it's sometimes, you. sometimes I'm not the one casting and I'm like standing, you know, I'm standing on the seat or whatever. And I'm just kind of spotting and looking at stuff. And I like freaking, you know, it's you, man. Like you can't blame anyone else. It's the same. You're like, standing on the bow. Everybody's watching you. You're the one casting. Yeah. yeah Economically, sure. it's probably a better way to do it. Cause it's like, sometimes we, you know, call them a $20 duck or whatever. It's like, oh yeah. Eight people put a round into him it's like for that sure. was an expensive it duck was an expensive right duck or one will fly away and he just keeps flying and they just everybody empty yeah. their gun and you're just like how did that happen but yeah. it happens i mean it happens to me i mean it's just the way it is that's, yeah. that's hunting my, my dad's best friend growing up i always called him uncle darren and his son uh is similar age to me his name's slate uh because mm-hmm. he was uh born around turkey season so they called named him slate. that's pretty cool that's a good name yeah. and he's he's a sharpshooter man you know yeah there's some people that just got it and he grew up and he like they he he uh got offered some like full ride scholarships and trap and ski really and, you know like down here in the southeast like i feel like our culture is a little bit different around that like, it is a little different and i actually shot competitively growing up a little bit and there was no young people doing it at the yeah. time it was all older people nothing against older retired people but that's just who it was shooting mm. you know what i mean like i was i was competing at the time i was like 12 and I was shooting against like five other people. Mm-hmm. Like there was just not a, there wasn't a, a competitive group of young men or girls at that yeah. time. And it kind of, I guess it kind of makes sense in a way because we just don't have as much waterfowl sure. and wing shooting. I mean, we sure. got quail, we got the hundred percent. But it's one of the things I was wondering too is like how how do you, how would you say like somebody could really get good at if they really want to get good at shooting? What, Shot, what, what's like that, shooting, wing shotgun. shooting? Yeah, wing shooting man just repetition just go out and you know just go to a trap range or i I wouldn't go to like a super sporty sporting range i would i would probably actually i why is that i mean i just think traps just pretty basic like you're you're standing at a stationary position the bird's coming out of a house it's Mm -hmm. either going to come from you know it's it's going to shoot at an angle it's not going to come at you it's not going to like whiz left to right at 100 miles an hour it's just you can slow it down like I got my fiance into shooting, um, recently and she, you know, she's taken to it very well, but it was the same thing. Like where we live down in Tarpon, we have Tampa Bay sporting clays and it's all sporting clays. But in that sporting clays course, I just went in and picked all the birds out that were, I don't want to say easy, but she knew where they were coming from. She could see them come out of the house and it was just, it it slowed things down for, I, Mm -hmm. I think, 
if I was going to teach somebody that had never picked a shotgun up before in their life and they wanted to get into wing shooting, I would tell them just to go to a trap range and just buy a case of shells and just wear yourself out. You know what I mean? Obviously have somebody there yeah. teaching you the basics of how to hold the gun, how to swing the gun, you know, how to stand, all that. Yeah. Well, it's so one of the things I would think like that kind of spun off of what you just said there is in, whether it's casting, mm-hmm. con- I don't care if it's conventional. Like I remember being a kid learning bait caster. My dad oh, sure. bought me a bait caster. He bought me one of those little weighted plugs yep. that I had to go outside. Or like that was when it. I had to learn to throw a cast net, yep. I got, he gave me an old cast net with holes. Yep. And he's like, and one of the things is like, you can throw that cast net really good in the yard. Uh, and then you, you can throw that fly rod in a field with no wind. You, you throw it a like hundred feet. Yeah, I mean, no yeah. problem. But now all of a sudden you're in a boat. Well, with shooting, you know, now all of a sudden you're sitting. It's, so like, it's, yeah, it's, it's different. very, very different. Like, you know, a lot of the blinds that we hunt out of in Nebraska, they're pit blinds. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people, you know, the adjustment of, of coming from a sitting position and grabbing your gun and coming out of a pit and getting your gun out of the pit, that was a little difficult for some people. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, they got it after a while. They figured out where they, how they need to hold their gun, when they need to stand up, how mm-hmm. they need to come out of the blind to do that. So you're, you're a hundred percent accurate with that. Um, yeah. I would say the transition from like the, the sporting clay range or the trap range or wherever you're doing it, if you're in a pasture and somebody's hand throwing you clays, yeah, that transition is huge because mm-hmm. you're probably doing it in jeans and a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you go into a duck blind, it's 20 degrees. You've got big jacket on you probably got gloves on, like you've never shot in that environment. So mm-hmm. yeah, I would say that, you know, that's probably an adjustment, you know what I mean? Yeah. As a, I don't, I don't really remember having that adjustment as a kid just cause I, you know, it was just, I mean, my, I remember my dad standing me on a bench or something in the blind and like, I just stood there with my gun mm-hmm. on my shoulder. Oh, I dude, I remember that adjustment because, um, the, whenever I had first started going duck hunting, I went in the blinds sure. and then when I was 16, I got a GNU. And I started going out on my own. Sure. And we were shooting out of this little gnu. Yeah. And you're seated and it's rickety. And, and the you blind, can't move. The, the pop up blind that we put on that gnu, it was tight. It yeah. was tighter than a dolphin's blowhole. And you had no like room, right? And it was like no room. And all of a sudden it was like, wow, this is just totally different. Mm-hmm. And it kind of like, to I was on um, Tom Rowland's podcast and I was like, you know, one of the things I think would be really fun to do, and I haven't I haven't made this investment yet, is like with casting, it's like get one of those like Bosa balls or whatever. It's like half the it's like half the exercise ball. Oh it yeah, has the platform. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, got to yeah, balance yeah. on you it or something. Balance on it and try to cast. And then like cast on it, dude. yeah, like because that's like you're 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 moving around or like and mm-hmm. then Tom and then Tom being Tom's like or you just cast one leg. And it's like oh yeah, that would probably be the cheaper. Yeah, like, you don't have to bring the same. <laughs> yeah, but it's like same with like if you're trying to shoot like you know. Um, sit on a cooler and then pop up and shoot. And yeah. it's like, I, I, I had a, uh, a guy who's in the minor leagues who, uh, he's from Florida state. He played on Florida state's baseball team. And mm-hmm. then he came back here after his first season. And he like lived at my house for like three months with my family and sure. everything. And me and him right now we're recording in my garage and I have like a garage gym. And we, <laughs> you know, I like to goof off with these guys. So I'm like, let's teach me what you're doing and uh, all that. And he's really big into the Tom Brady stuff. Okay. Tom Brady, he wrote a book called TB12 Method. And he's all about like when you're training in sports, a lot of guys like they want to get big arms. They want to get whatever. Sure. Tom's like, no, I, I want to train for what I do. Yeah. To throw the football. So like to kind of, yeah, I throw the football and I get hit by people. That's yep. what, so Tom Brady literally trains to get hit by people and to throw a football. And so he, everything about his training methods look different. Well, I think to like translate that and what we're talking about, it's mm-hmm. like, what you're saying makes perfect sense. It's like, you know, some guy's been shooting traps, standing up in the sure. perfect position, sure. no gloves on, no sure. jacket on, or some guy's been casting in the yards. So it's like either you can get out there. Obviously the preferable thing is like get out there and do it. Yeah. But I mean, not everyone can do that. Like not everybody can do that. Not everybody can say, okay, I'm going to go waterfowl hunting, you know, 30 days out of a 60 day season and get really good at this. Yeah. Like it's just even, you know, before this season, like I, I duck hunted recreationally as much as I could and I still didn't get to duck hunt as much as I would. I mean, it's yeah. just the nature of the beast. People have lives. They got to work. You know but what I mean? trying to like coach up clients, like, Hey, like when you practice, like, you know, if you're going to sight down here, you, you actually can duck hunt a decent bit without yeah. gloves, but yeah. like just practice with your gloves on. Who cares if your hands are hot? You like, know, and it, it, like I had, I had a guy, um, I hunted one day up there this year and he had, we were hunting a, a pretty small pit that we call cedars and he was having trouble getting up and like bring his gun to his shoulder to get up out of there because it's just a really tight, small pit. And you know, after the first volley of birds came through, we all, they missed, I said, just practice, like unload your gun 
and just stand up and just try and shoulder your gun as fast as you can and just try and get comfortable doing that. And he did that a couple of times and that was good. So, yeah. Do you, like, um, we were talking earlier about, uh, whitetail hunting and mm-hmm. one of the things I always do when I get up in, in, in a stand. Sure. So I just do a couple, like it'll be, I don't care if it's pitch black. I just yeah, need to man. kind of where the, cre- like, where's it going to creak? Like, can I, yeah. cause I don't know if you've ever been in the scenario before where a deer walks out and then you're like, I haven't thought through how I would make that shot right how am i going to make this move to either get my gun or my bow around to do that it's funny you say that um one of the you know the guys like i told you jake latondra so i was talking to him the other day and he's a big avid bow hunter Mm -hmm. um he told me when he gets in to you know sit down and deer hunt or not when he gets in when he sees a deer come out like if he sees his target buck come out he says he has a checklist that he goes through. He looks down, looks at all of his clothes, makes sure that there's nothing he's going to snag on. Mm-hmm. Like he said, it's just repetition and he just, you know, it's just, it, it's, it'd be second nature to us. Like, you know, you're sitting there ready for a shot when a tarpon comes swimming down the beach and then, you know, all of a sudden, boom, there he is. And he's 50 feet away from the boat. You just, you quick cast and boom, you drop it. He told me he's just got it down to a repetition to where he can just look down. He knows exactly where all of his stuff is on his shoulders, on his binos, whatever he's got. And it's just automatic. So mm-hmm. it's just repetition, man. What what do you feel like coming off of duck season, spending that time up there, mm-hmm. and now you're gearing up and you're going to go into fishing season down mm-hmm. here? What do you feel like you're bringing back with you, for lack of a better phrase, as a, as a guide? Like, mm-hmm. what do you feel like you've improved in or grown in this past season? Um man, I, I was like a sponge this season. I mean, like I said, I've been hunting in Nebraska my entire life, but you know, I had, I I was just a sponge. I mean, Jake's an incredible waterfowl hunter and an incredible guide. So like every time he, he's just one of those people, he's very well spoken. So like mm-hmm. when he would talk, everybody's listening. So I would say the one thing that I probably brought back from that, hmm, details, little things you know like with fly fishing you know and bill fishing too it's very detail oriented um but there's sometimes that we we overlook those little details and i i'm uh you know with hunting and fishing i like to keep things simple i'm Mm -hmm. not (laughs) we all like to keep it simple until you're not getting bites right the next thing you know you're looking at everything um so i would say the details but like when i say details like You yeah, know, talk me through that. Like, what's, what's yeah, like on the duck he, hunting what, what side did you of things. Pick up from him. Okay, know? so like on the duck hunting side mm-hmm. of things, you know, if you know we get a you know a group of birds working around us, and you know they make one pass and they they look like they're gonna do it, and then on the second pass they still don't do it, and then on mm-hmm. the third pass they come around and they don't flare, but they just there's something there. You know what I mean? Like. Mm-hmm. And trying to figure that out, this is the fun part about tarpon fishing. And this this is kind of the similarity in tarpon fishing and duck hunting for me is like to get a duck to 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 bow up like a horseshoe and land in your face is difficult sometimes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He wants to see a certain thing. He wants to hear a certain thing. And a tarpon is the same way. For him to eat your fly, he wants to see a certain thing. It needs to be presented in the right way. It's got to be at the right angle, however you want to slice it. So when I'm talking about details, like if a group of birds didn't do it, we, you know, we'll walk out and take a look at it and try and tweak this and move these couple decoys. And like, maybe he flew over this at the wrong time, or maybe we pulled the jerk string at the wrong time. Or Mm -hmm. like, maybe this client had his face out of the blind. Like it's the tiniest little details that make the difference in when you're talking about, you know, I guess the ultimate in outdoors. Like Mm -hmm. for me, it's just, it's tarpon fishing and duck hunt, man. I mean, that's just what it is. Like it's, that's the ultimate, you know what I mean? Like there's, yeah. I, I don't, I, I can't think of anything else that I've experienced in the outdoors that compares to watching a, a tarpon, you know, eat your fly five feet off the boat or watching a group of 50 mallards land in your face. Like that just does something for you. I want to see an elk. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> like just I, I would. I, I've been bow range. Like I've always. Man, I, I would. I've die never to see. That. I've never gone on an elk hunt, and I want to. I've just always thought, like, how does? Let's go to the conversation we're having. Sure. Right. You're trying to like practice. You know, think about like 3D archery. Sure. You know? Sure. Okay. Here's my white. Here's yeah. my eight point buck coming. You yeah. Know? It's like these guys 
how do you even tr- begin to try to create the moment where you're standing there, you've been hiking for three, da- three days, and all of a sudden this monster yeah. animal with the biggest rack you've ever it's seen walks screaming like, in your face. Like, how do you even, cre- how do you even begin? How do you it's keep like, it together? Yeah. At that point, I'm just throwing my bow at him and I'm running away. Like, yeah. I don't know, man. Like, I, I've never, you know, I've seen elk, like, you know, just driving through the mountains of Colorado yeah. or Wyoming or whatever, but I've, I've never elk hunted before, so... I don't know. I've, I've asked myself that question like numerous times or like, you know, somebody, when I, you know, I have a lot of friends that have killed some giant whitetails with their bows Mm -hmm. at like 10 yards. I'm just like, how in the hell did you keep it together to do that? But like going back to what you're saying, like an elk, like, how do you do that? Like, how do you, how do you calm yourself down enough to, I I don't know, I guess repetition, repetition. I guess you're at the moment, you're probably, you're probably just like, all right, I got to get this done. You know what I mean? It's like anything else. Yeah, you got to get this done, and you got to just zero in on what's in front of you. Got to lock it in. Everybody's different. I know, like in my head, you know, when I start thinking about like, what if I miss a shot? What if it's the only shot I get today? What if like, what is what is the guide gonna think? What's Mm -hmm. my friend gonna think? What's Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it's like, hold on, hold on, no, I got to zero in. Yeah, on this moment. Yeah, you know, one of the things too I was interested in about like some of the carryovers. Like, there's the obvious, but it's you're thinking about as a guide. Um, and I can't remember who said this on the podcast, but it was really good. He was just talking about, I think it was Benny. It was, yeah, it was Benny. He was like, mm-hmm. Benny Blanco is like, your job is to eliminate variables, eliminate variables, yeah. eliminate variables. There's yeah. still a chance. Like you don't know that ducks are going to fly over this spot. You right. don't know that the fish are going to be like, I don't care who you are. They're animals. But your job as a guide is to try to eliminate as many of those yes. variables as possible. Yes. So, okay, there's the obvious, but I'm kind of curious on this. Like mm-hmm. there's wind, right? Like you're sure. looking at wind. Sure. Tarpon fishing, you're looking at wind. Sure. Duck hunting, you're looking at wind. Sure. You know, you're looking at weather. You're sure. looking at water temperature versus, you know. Yeah. If, like, tell me about how you think through, like, where are you going to sit? And just kind of give me a little bit of how you've learned about trying to make those plans and the preparation piece. How those are we talking about correlate. fishing or are we talking about hunting? Yes. Both. Both. Like, what are some of the kind of things that you pulled through? So out? I think, you know, I can speak for every single tarpon guide on the planet to say that you got to get in a groove. Mm-hmm. You got to get in a groove and just time on the water, man. And the same thing goes for duck hunting. Like, if you think you're just going to show up and go out there and smack them or, you know, go out and, you know, jump 10 fish in a day, like, it's not going to happen. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, you might get lucky and that might happen to you, but you got to put your time in for that. And I think to do that, it just requires a lot of patience, mm-hmm. a lot of, a lot of hard work. I mean, nobody, nobody in this industry is successful. If you're going to measure, if you're going to measure success by, you know, heavy straps of birds or how many fish somebody has jumped in a day, I personally do not measure success that way. So if you're going to measure success that way, nobody, nobody had that happen by accident. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That came from hard work, whether it was toting 10 dozen decoys into the woods or, you push your boat into a headwind for 200 yards to get your client the shot. Like, or, you know, you, you, you went out tarpon fishing one day and, and your plan A didn't work out. So you, you know, you grinded your ass off and you went and found a plan B for your client. And then next thing you know, you found a new spot. Mm -hmm. It's hard work, man. I mean, it's just, it's hard work. And, you know, I'm fortunate to have some of my best friends are some of, who are, you know, my mentors in fishing and in hunting, Mm -hmm. um, who are some of the hardest workers in the world and nobody, I I don't want to say nobody, but I feel like, I feel like everybody has a mentor in some way, some shape or form, you know, whether it's one person or whether it's multiple people. For me, I've had, you know, a couple different mentors in my life, you know, when it comes to life lessons, when it comes to hunting, when it comes to fishing. So, and like I said, I've been fortunate to have some of the best, in my opinion, some of the best in the sport. Like, you know, my fishing mentor, he's not on social media. <laughs> he could walk down the street right now and you would never assume it, but Mm -hmm. I'm 100% convinced he's one of the best fishermen that live in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Like he's, you can put him in any environment and he'll go head to head with anybody and they'll, he's, he's, he'll figure it out. Like Mm -hmm. you can just drop him off in whatever place you want to put him in and he'll figure it out. And I was fortunate enough to become best friends with him and he showed me a lot. Um, 
but at the same time, you know, let that not, don't, don't, don't confuse that with somebody who's just showing you everything, mm -hmm. you know, that there's a difference between somebody taking you and just spoon feeding you all of this knowledge and showing you how to do it. Mm -hmm. There has to be, um, some sort of period in every, whether you're a guide or whether you're just a, an outdoorsman, there has to be some sort of a phase of obsession there. Mm -hmm. You have to obsess about your craft and, and master it to how you want it to figure it out, you know, to get that self gratification. Like you, it, when you, when you, when you land on that, because then you appreciate it. Mm -hmm. If somebody just takes you out and they say, this is where you catch the tarpon. This is the fly you throw at them. This is how you present it to them. This is how you strip it. If somebody showed you all of that and they were literally holding your hand every day, showing you that you wouldn't love it mm -hmm. because there's no self gratification there. So you know, when you figure something out or you find a new spot or, you know, whatever it might be, when you finally put those pieces of the puzzle together, it's just like, wow, that's, that's mm -hmm. pretty cool, man. And to me, that's what, you know, that's kind of what led me to guiding is trying to, I want to share that with people. Like I want to show people like the potential of tarpon fishing. Like, you know, people think, you know, tarpon fishing, oh, we're going to go sit under a bridge in the Keys or we're going to go to Boca Grand Pass and soak a crab or whatever. Mm -hmm. Nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. Mm -hmm. It's sporting. It's fun. That's not the full potential of, of that fish. Like, I want to show people that. And I want to I want to see people's reactions. Mm -hmm. To me, that's what that is. That's, that's guiding as a whole is, you know, showing somebody an experience that they had no idea existed. Mm -hmm. So that, that to me is that that's, that's the cool part about it. Absolutely. All right. If you're ready, we're gonna do some rapid fire questions Shoot. and we're going to talk some food. Okay. I texted you earlier today. Yeah, I was like, let's yeah, talk yeah. about some food. So yeah, let's, sure. let's start there because I recently, uh, like I came on with Traeger and we're going to, you know, do these little segments in the podcast and create some blog posts and just kind of create some content around the food side of things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I've been cooking on that and, and love it. Um, in your family, you know, you got the Greek background, which is very interesting, yeah. you know, cause I feel like, um, you're probably the first Greek guy that sure. I, at least that sure. I, know. I don't know that yeah. I know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and, um, so tell me a little bit about what you like to cook and how the food industry side of things has kind of played out. Cause I feel like the outdoor community loves to cook, loves to eat. Yeah. So, you know, kind of growing up, you know, we really didn't have a choice. You kind of learned how to, had, you know, you had to cook yeah. pretty much. Um, is that like a Greek, like, I think I saw, what, is that like a Greek thing? I mean, cause I don't know if it's my a wife Greek loves thing. that movie, my big fat Greek wedding, okay, so but every, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. Okay. So everything in that movie is accurate except for the Windex. I don't know where they got the Windex thing okay, from. That was just like a, like, yeah, a, I don't know. I don't okay. know where they got that I've never from. seen it. So it's, it's hilarious and it's yeah. very accurate. Um, but going back to the cooking thing, so cooking, you know, growing up, like, you know, obviously, you know, I was taught to whatever you catch, if you're going to kill it, you know, you got to eat it, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a young man, you try to, you try to figure things out and figure out how to do it. But you're, you know, my mom and my grandfather and my uncle and everybody kind of taught us how to cook. Now our style of cooking is simplicity. Like we don't use a whole lot of like crazy spices, like you know, and recently I've actually cooked on a Traeger. I don't have a Traeger, mm -hmm. but I've, I've cooked on a Traeger a few times and they're pretty cool. I mean, mm -hmm. the food's really good on them. I've eaten steaks off them. I've eaten fish off of them. Uh, the boys at FOE, they did some ribs on them. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I saw that. Sawyer did some ducks. ducks Brett Martina won that rib. Yeah. Off. I wasn't that's there a, to eat a, those. You know, I wasn't there. I, no, I'm I, saying that, you know, us North Florida guys, yeah. you know, won that. So just yeah, let that be a lesson yeah, to the yeah, Central yeah, and South yeah, Florida yeah. guys. Brett there. was out. Brett, Brett was definitely, uh, he said early on that he was going to win that. I was pulled. I mean, he won't tell, I tried to get his recipe for soft shell crabs on here. He wouldn't tell me crap. He wouldn't even tell me. He was just basically like, yeah, he no, told me the he's, temperature. He's from that Apalachicola. You, they're pretty tight. He told me like, there. I was like, basically walk me through. He's like, get your crabs. And then he told me the temp. And then that's like, it. He's like, fry them. That's, <laughs> that's my it. recipe. I yeah. was like, thank you, Brett. That's yeah. Now, um, yeah. So, all right. Talk me through, man. Give me, give me a little something. Give me a recipe. So here. I haven't done these on a Traeger, but I guarantee you they would be good. Um, we have a recipe. We call them you peel them shrimp. You know, I'm sure everybody has you peel them shrimp, but the way we do them is, Take a really good, high quality olive oil, mm -hmm. um, mix it with a lot of lemon juice, garlic, oregano, salt, pepper. 
Um, okay. You know, put that in a bottle, put it in a jar, however you want to do it. Shake it up real good. Put them on the grill in the shell. You can put them on a skewer or you can just put them on a piece of foil on the grill. Mm -hmm. As they're cooking, start basing them with that. Okay. Um, and if I was going to do them on that Traeger, this is exactly how I would do them. I would, I would baste them with that, you know, lemon pepper, garlic sauce, mm -hmm. a lot of heavy on the pepper too. That's really important. Um, but right before they were done, I would have a pan full of, full of, uh, that, you know, lemon, olive oil, pepper concoction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would have it on there already simmering right before the shrimp were done. I would probably put them in that pan and let them simmer in that juice and then finish in there mm -hmm. and then pull them out and eat them, man. Get a loaf of get a loaf of bread and sit down and eat a bunch of shrimp. And that now, would be is a loaf of bread a Greek thing? Oh yeah, you gotta have a loaf of Greek bread for sure. How do you know what good Greek bread is? Is there like a like we have that, Greek food up here? I don't know if it's legit. Okay, it's like so good Greek and bread. Like Zoe's. Yeah, oh, I've never eaten there. <laughs> okay, come it's down chain. to Tarpon, man. Just right. come down to Tarpon. I, I am. I'm coming yeah. down. I'm coming down this season. Come down Tarpon. You fish. offered that a while back. Yeah, I'm gonna man. cash it in. Come down Tarpon fish. All right. Um, so. Yeah, good Greek bread is, you know, you got a nice brown crust on the outside and the inside needs to be super soft. And that's just... That that's is, what you're looking for. That's what you're looking for. If you're biting into Greek bread and there's any kind of crusty or hardness, no good. You know what would be good about that? It's taking that bread and then taking the leftover juice that, on the plate. You see, and man, see you already know. That's exactly what you do. You get your you get your shrimp, you put them yeah. on a the plate, and then you take a couple spoonfuls of your sauce there. And then when you're done eating your shrimp, you're sopping up all that for sure. I mean, you know what would be good with that shrimp? Greek salad. Oh, yeah. I love Greek. I, you know, I'm going to check this after this. When I was a kid going to Tampa, mm -hmm. we used to go to a Greek restaurant. It was probably Tapas's. Dude, it probably was. Cause they, so, but they also had Cuban sandwiches. Uh, I think it might have been us, maybe. Uh, so my we would get really good Greeks, dude. We would get really good Greek salads there. My great grandfather, um, you know, a traditional Greek salad has potato salad in it. Okay. My great grandfather, and you know, I'm not. I I I don't think I could prove this, but he sort of patented or invented the potato salad in the bottom of a Greek salad. Okay. When he was cooking for General Pershing. They only had a certain amount of time to eat every day. So he wanted them to get, you know, their potatoes, their meat, and their vegetables what? all in one. So he would take the potato salad, he would make that, yeah. put it in the bottom of a salad with with, you know, your radishes, your tomatoes, your cucumbers, all your vegetables. That no, you no, no, give eat. me that. Can you give me the talk through? What do, um let's say that with this recipe, okay? Yeah. We're doing the shrimp. Sure. We're we're outsourcing the Greek bread. Sure. To your local. Yeah. And we're making a Greek salad. What are we putting in there? Can you tell me without giving me, I don't want to like steal any family secrets, but I want to make my own Greek no, salad. No, I mean, I okay. So your potato salad, if you want like traditional, you know, real potato salad. Yeah, I, I want like real, I want like a real yeah, Greek salad. Yeah, you got to come to Tarpon Springs. But okay, well, I'm the trying. lettuce side of things, you're, you're going to have your iceberg lettuce, um, radishes, cucumbers, tomatoes, actually an anchovy on top. One um, anchovy. One anchovy. <laughs> Some beets. Yeah, like it. Some beets. If you see two anchovies, take that it place back. sucks. That, that's a yeah, fake. take it back. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and actually, they'll put a boiled shrimp or two on top, too. Um, Gosh, that sounds And good. then some potato salad underneath it. And then white vinegar. Okay. White vinegar, oregano, and a really good olive oil. All right. You got it, man. All right. We're pu I'm putting that together. And yeah, dude. Um, all right. So let's go to some rapid fire questions now that, sure. now that I'm officially hungry sure. and I'm about to eat dinner after this anyway, so <laughs> we're good to go. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite thing about duck hunting? Like what, what is it that draws you to duck hunting out of Man. all the types of hunting? You know, this is, a, this is cause pretty... you could have done quail. Yeah, yeah. I would say, and I love to deer hunt too. Don't get me wrong. I would say, you know, duck hunting is definitely takes, it takes it over deer hunting though. I would say, the one thing I love about duck hunting is watching birds react, or any animal for that matter, react to a call. Okay. But, you know, that can also be, you know, it can be a bad thing too because there's some days they don't want to be called at super loud. Some mm -hmm. days it's just got to be quiet and, you know, got to let them do their thing. But the one thing I like about duck hunting is it's it would have to be that or it would have to be to figure out where they want to be. Mm -hmm. that's probably number one honestly that's number one for me yeah figuring out where they want to be and how i can get there mm -hmm. you know to get in position and hide and you know create if only you could call tarpon in which yeah, andy mill man. 
Andy Mill had a photo the other day of him smoking a cigar and he called it a fish whistle. It's a fish a whistle, fish yeah. Whistle. Fish yeah, yeah. whistle. Yeah. yeah, I would say that's accurate. I mean, that guy's pulled on a few, so he knows exactly what to do. He needs his one. own line. I'm going to uh, shoot a message after this. He needs his own line of cigars Facts. called the fish whistle. Facts. So we're gonna Mills work on fish that. whistle or something. That'd be sick. Yeah, dude. I don't even smoke cigars, but yeah, I would, I would, smoke, I would smoke one for sure. Absolutely. 100%. All right, so you, you, know, you talked about you're a younger guy compared to like guys like, you know, obviously Andy and guys mm-hmm. who just been around sure. forever and just legends in sure. the industry. And you talked about the mentor piece yeah. as a younger guy in the in- industry. What, what do you think is the most important factor for you to be able to actually learn from those guys? Like, how do you learn from a mentor? Just shut up and listen. You know, I'm 34 years old. I've fished all over the world i've hunted all over the country and like i you just shut your mouth and listen mm-hmm. anybody who thinks they know everything is just they're a fool mm-hmm. i mean you can learn so much more by just keeping your mouth shut and listening you know what i mean like there's there's so much to be learned and you know what i feel like you know that generation of fishermen and hunters are more willing to teach somebody mm-hmm. that you know is humble you know be humble be be humble, be a hard worker and, you know, just put your head down and, and, and show these people that you want to number one, take care of the resource that you're, that they're trying to show and teach you about. Mm -hmm. I would say that's number one. Number two, um, you know, work hard and number three, just try and preserve it. I mean, that's the best way I can describe it, man. I mean, I've always had that mentality when it comes to hunting and fishing, let's preserve what we got preserve you know what our our grandfathers and fathers have taught us you know because it's still the same methods whether we want to believe it or not some Mm -hmm. of the things that we're still doing hunting and fishing these days our fathers and grandfathers were doing Mm -hmm. you know we might we might tweak it or do it this way or that way but it's the same thing it's the basics man so Mm -hmm. i would just say shut up and listen (laughs) And I think there's always a tendency, and I think social media has amplified this. Mm-hmm. I, don't want to go on, I don't want to go on a massive social media rant here. Sure. But um, to try to prove ourselves, mm-hmm. especially when you're young and you just want to prove yourself, and to the extent that you aren't willing to just say, I don't know how to do that, or, hey, how do you do that? I'd like to learn from you. Yeah, man. I mean, a- asking questions is... And I, I'll straight up, I, I, I have, there's an, I, I will be a chatterbox. Mm-hmm. I'll ask somebody a thousand questions until they'll just be like, dude, shut up. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, if I don't know something, I'm going to ask somebody. I'm not going to walk around like I know what I'm talking about. Like, if I don't know something or if I see somebody that, you know, I'm on the boat with or I'm in the blind with and they, they did something that I saw was effective, I'm going to be like, hey, man, like, mm-hmm. what is that? Or like, how do you do that? Or like, what's the deal? You know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> I'll ask somebody if they're willing to share it with me. That's great. If not, that's fine. Mm-hmm. I, 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 you know, I, I don't, I'm not expecting people to like give me their knowledge by any means, mm-hmm. but well, and even before I started this podcast, that's kind of, we were talking about this earlier, but I was kind of already doing this. I just didn't have the gear. Mm-hmm. I was just kind of talking to people, asking people, Sure, but I had somebody that, you know, I'm a college pastor in Tallahassee and, um, I had the guy that mentored me the most in that is our senior pastor at city church. And Mm -hmm. when I was 18 years old, I just been so impacted by everything that I I just realized I wanted to give my life to helping people experience what I had experienced at city church. There's no like nothing super weird, no like visions, stars spelling, nothing like that. Just, I just wanted to help people experience what I experienced. And so he began to mentor me. And one of the things he told me whenever I started to get around some other guys that were doing things that are just really, really great innovative, great leaders was anytime that somebody gives you the time, take the time up front yeah. to sit down and like, have questions. So yeah. like, if, if you're like, Hey, I, I want to get coffee <clears throat> with you or like in our context, it's like, okay, let's say that I've done this before. I've done this where like, I, I've just sat on a boat before and observed sure. somebody doing their job sure. as a guide or whatever. Absolutely. It's like, have a few questions and say like, I know what I want to talk to this guy about so yeah. that you're not just blabbering and you look back and you're like, dang, I didn't even ask him about Blank, this, this, you know? and this. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's really helpful. What what do you think is as somebody who's on the younger side of the industry of things, mm-hmm. what do you think is the the biggest area that we need to course correct? Mm. There's no etiquette. 
<clears throat> there's no etiquette anymore, man. Hunting and fishing, there's no etiquette. Um, you know, nobody owns the water or owns the woods, but, you know, I guess uh, this is a, this is a touchy one because people get real mm-hmm. sour. They're like, well, you don't own this flat or you don't own this stretch of beach or whatever mm-hmm. it is. But like, you're right. I don't own it. And I was, you know, there was somebody, there was probably somebody tarpon fishing out there before I was tarpon fishing, or there was somebody set up in that duck hole before I was, maybe they weren't, maybe I'm the first one that found this spot mm-hmm. or whatever. Like there's just no etiquette. There's zero respect on the water. Why do you, do you, do you have a reason you think that is? Or I think people are just, they're selfish, they're greedy. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll do anything for a grip and grin photo. Mm-hmm. And it does, it doesn't matter if it's deer, ducks or tarpon, like they'll do anything for a grip and grin photo. Um, you know, just recently, like somebody was, you know, I was talking to somebody about social media and they were like, look, man, like, you know, a lot of people need to pay attention of, you know, before they post a picture, ask yourself the reason of why you're posting this picture. Hmm. What's the, what's the purpose? Are you posting it for, you know, you know, for people to pump you up? Are you posting it for business? Are you posting it for, to educate people? What's the reason for this? And like, I feel like if people ask themselves that before they acted on the water or in the woods, a lot of that would be alleviated. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, if I'm set up tarpon fishing, somebody comes and sets up 50 yards down my line, all they had to do is ask themselves, like, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, there's just, I was, I guess I was taught a different way. And I feel like there's a lot of people that just jump into things. And, you know, I used to get really mad at people and, and try to, I would, I'd get frustrated and I, I always try to maintain a, a level of professionalism when I have somebody on the boat, like I'll never lose my cool. Mm-hmm. You'll never see me start cussing at another guide or, you know, a recreational fisherman for that matter. Like I always try to stay professional. So instead of losing my cool, I'll just calmly drive over and just be like, Hey man, like, you know, I'm fishing here. You know, is there any way that, you know, you could slide down the line? Like, you know, I don't know if you set up here on purpose. Most of the time it works. Sometimes they're, you know, you'll get the guy that'll just be like, yeah, screw off, man. Like I'm going to do whatever I want to do. So I don't know to answer your question. I don't know why people do it. I think people just, I I, I guess that, you know, the best answer is greed and being selfish. They want, they, they want, they want something for themselves out of it. And it's usually a fish or a duck or a deer or whatever it might be. Mm. Um, my last one is lots of gear in the outdoor world. It's hunting gear, you know, oh, there's a million things. One of the challenging things with younger guys, mm-hmm. you know, you and me and you are sitting here and we're, we're under 40, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, I know guys that they spend their whole life accumulating great gear. Yeah. You know, they buy they, the, the old saying, buy once, cry once, or yeah. buy right, cry once. That's what yeah, it is. Yeah, buy yeah, right, yeah, cry yeah, once. Yeah, yeah. Tell me through like sequencing for you, because there's just a lot of gear that comes with all this. Yeah, sure. How how do you try to think about how to accumulate good gear? Like, how do you think through what matters and what doesn't matter? And what are you going to buy now? Um, later? You know, a lot of people think, I, and I, my mentality has changed over the years with this. I was, Mm -hmm. you know, before I still am kind of gear crazy when it comes to my hunting gear. I like, and my friends will laugh about it if they're going to listen to this. I like to buy hunting gear. I mean, it's just, it's one of my things, but you know, with gear, if it works and it functions Mm -hmm. and I'm taking care of it properly and it's holding up, that's good gear to me. Mm -hmm. So, what was what was the exact question one more time? How, how do you think through the sequencing of it? By that I just mean like it's like you know you can't buy everything you want right now. So sure. you got to like figure out like I'm going to buy this. Then oh, this, you're this, talking you know, about like, like what's priority? Yeah, maybe. yeah. How do you figure out the priority or yeah. you know? I feel like if if you're gonna you know let's just talk about tarpon fishing for an example. I know you don't want to keep touching on that, but <laughs> that's okay. It um, happens. You know, tarpon fishing like if you you don't need a $70,000 skiff to go Mm -hmm. catch tarpon. Like when I first got crazy about, you know, fly fishing for tarpon, I was doing it on a bay boat with a tower. Like Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were some people looking at me like, what in the hell? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you don't need a big fancy boat to do it on. You know, you don't need a a $1,600 rod. You know, you don't need the best line. Just go do it, man. Mm -hmm. Just, just grab something that works for you that you can afford 
and then build it up over time. Like, you know, it is, it's an expensive sport. Hunting and fishing is not cheap. I mean, yeah, it's very much a lifestyle. Yeah. It's not a hobby. It's not like you're, you know, you can't, you can't just jump into it and say, okay, I'm going to take 10 grand and go buy all new fly rods, all new fly reels, you know, five weight all the way through a 12 weight. Like, some people don't have that luxury. I was one of them. I still don't have that luxury. Mm-hmm. Like I, I try to maintain my gear over the years, but I guess just build it up. You know what I mean? If I was going to get into fly, if I was going to get somebody into fly fishing for the first time, I would say the rod is obviously more important than the reel. Um, you know, a decent rod will make you a better caster in a way it, 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 you know, loads faster. It'll, it'll create, it, it'll just make things easier for you. Um, same thing goes with duck hauls. You know, a lot of people want to buy like a cheap duck call for their first duck call and, you know, they'll grow out of it quick and they're just not getting what they want out of it anymore. Like, yeah. you know, I'm not saying to go spend 200 bucks on a, uh, you know, handcrafted acrylic duck call, but like, you know, get a better duck call. Like try it. If you're going to really get into it, like get some, get some decent stuff, but the priority of that, you know, that comes with your style of what you're doing too. You know, mm-hmm. like if you're, if you're if you're going to go stand in the marsh and you're going to be belly deep in the marsh every day and you're going to be a walk-in duck hunter, you need to have some jam up waders for sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if you're going to go on a boat, waders might not be that important to you. You know, my dad and I were just talking about that with waders because he was up in Tennessee and he was fish or he was uh, duck hunting with a bunch of guys who were using the banded Mm -hmm. and they were talking about, you know, Mm -hmm. Sika had like a lifetime guarantee, but they like these banded and all that sure, stuff. Sure. And we were talking down here. I was like, you know, in our area for what we do, you know, you're doing a lot of wood duck hunts, mm-hmm. you're doing some stuff in boats and, um, you know, we got redheads, so you're doing some coastal stuff. Sure. I was like, but the way that those guys like use their waders sure. is so intense that it's they're a thousand dollar pair of waders. I, man, I have had the same pair of waders I'm not, they're not going to last my lifetime, but I've had the same pair of waders for 10 years yeah. and they still don't have holes Yeah, and I just don't put them through the abuse. So that's, that's smart. They're like, all right. And it just kind of reminds me of what you're talking about. Like, uh, with shooting, mm-hmm. slow down, slow it down. Okay. Don't look at social media. Cause don't do that. Don't fall into that trap. It, I mean, yeah. just get what works for you. Just figure slow out down, what slow down, you. figure out what is going to help you obtain the best experience. I'm huge on the experience, like, and you know, the experience is different for everybody, but the way that I want the experience to be on my boat or in the woods with me, like it's, it's different. Like I, I, and if if people don't like the way that I'm doing that, then they're not going to come back to me. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? But that's, that's me. I'm big on the experience. So however, whatever helps you obtain the best experience, I guess that's where you need to Mm -hmm. prioritize your gear. Mm -hmm. whether it's staying warm in the deer blind or like, you know, if you've got, if your feet get freezing cold, maybe you need to get those Arctic shield things that go over your boots. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, that's just, that's how I would prioritize it, I guess. And a good way to do that. I'm doing that. Like at this season in my life, I'm trying to slowly do that and it's painful. And a lot of times my friends are buying stuff before me and and I mean, and it's fine. You know, you just, you got to focus on what you're trying to accomplish Yeah, is like, I'll go through it. I'll just get started. And then at the end of that season, you like get whatever, whatever you have everything. Then I'm on. thinking through, I'm like, okay, what did I need this past season? Yeah. And then now guess what? It's on sale. It's on sale because yep. like, so you're coming off duck season yep. and you're thinking all through like, what did I need? Well, now it's all sale. on sale. Well, yeah. not buy it now, but it's tough. Cause like, then you're, then it's just going to sit in your closet for a year. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it, that, that makes it tough, but it's smarter that way. <laughs> it is because it's smarter that you, way for sure. If you just take a pause and say, what do I need right now? Sure. Then at the end of that season, while mm-hmm. it's still fresh mm-hmm. and it's going on sale, I think that's a good tip that. Yeah. That I mean, that, I would say that is a good tip. You know what I mean? Cause all these companies do have sales and you know, I don't know if Sika has sales all the time, but you know, or if they do at all, but yeah, it's still a lot of people still myself included still can't afford it probably yeah it's expensive man <laughs> it really is but it does keep you warm it i can buy the sticker dry. yeah <laughs> it keeps you warm and it keeps you dry no That's for the sure yeah thing and you know what it goes back to the buy buy right cry once yeah mentality of like i Pretty have much the same pair of muck boots you know um there's a lot of good equipment that i actually have a lot of my um my gear I inherited from my dad that he bought really mm-hmm. great Cabela's gear back. Oh in the yeah. Day. The Cabela's gear back in the day was it, legit. I, I, I hunt sometimes in Cabela's gear yeah. that is older than me. Yeah, for sure. Pretty I awesome. mean, I, I went to Western Nebraska this year 
with socks that my uncle gave me that I know were every bit of 40 years old. Uh, like that, now that is kind of crazy. Like he, you know, he hunted out there quick history about that. My granddad and all of his friends and my uncle, they hunted with a guy out there. They started hunting out there 40 years ago mm -hmm. and they were all really tight. They would hunt out there every season. So when he heard I was going out there for a waterfowl season, he's like, come here, boy, I got to give you something. And he's like a hero. I mean, this guy's like a World War II legend. He's got the mm -hmm. Purple Heart. Like, he's the man. He walks me into his room, and he hands me, like, 10 pairs of, like, wool socks. I'm like, I'm not going to wear these. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Sure enough, I got out there, and I was like, I'll try them. And dude, they are, like, legit. Well, I don't know if they're, like, military-issued or what they are, but they're legit. I mean, and, you know, who knows? He probably paid five bucks a pair for them. Mm -hmm. meanwhile we're dropping 40 bucks on smart wool and like all yeah. that crazy stuff you know here's my last question you, sure. earlier you mentioned you know people measure success different ways with gripping grins mm -hmm. and the weight of their strap or whatever sure. um for you what how do you measure success like what let me reframe it what is in the when you think about your future as a guide and in mm -hmm. the outdoor industry what does success look like for you hmm you know, obviously everybody wants to make a living doing this. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's, you know, to make a living guiding, that's what everybody wants to do. But mm -hmm. success <clears throat> for me in this industry, you know, just to, I guess when I'm all said and done with it and I shut my eyes, you know, the people that I, that I did go hunting and fishing with or that I did share experiences with, I, w I want them to just remember that, you know, we just had a good time and mm -hmm. everybody was smiling and, you know, that to me is success. Like that's, you know, obviously, you know, catching a big tarpon and getting a face grab on the side of the boat or, you know, a big strap of mallards, you know, sitting on the river like that. Everybody wants that, but yeah, that's success. But I think the success comes from sharing time, sharing stories, um, you know, it just comes back to sharing an experience. Like there's so many things that you see that you, you I, I can't even recall some of the things that I saw this waterfowl season out there that, you know, it was just, it was part of the experience. Like, I mean, you're, you're sitting in a duck blind and you know, you see 5,000 migrating geese fly over your head. Like that's crazy. You know, we never even blew a goose call at them. You just watch them or, you know, watching, 250,000 ducks on a big corn feed or something in a big tornado. And we never even had a gun in our hand. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, that's just, that's one of those things. It's just, you know, or watching, you know, a migrating string of tarpon at first light, just all laid up with their tail fins poking out of the water. Like that's, that's cool stuff, man. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the stuff, you know what I mean? And then, you know, sharing that with people that you enjoy being around, whether it's clients or family or friends, excuse me, mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. Um, I think that's, that's the success in the business that, and just taking care of the, of the, of the resources that we have. I think that's very important. And I feel like that would be successful. You know, like mm -hmm. if you look at some of the, the species in Florida that, you know, a bounce back of conservation, like look at alligators. I mean, mm -hmm. alligators have made an incredible comeback in Florida. Mm -hmm. manatees have there's a lot of manatees these days yeah um, our deer numbers are high I deer mean, numbers are high you know our turkey numbers are high in a lot of areas right here. you know and you know there's a, there is a lot of things that have man has done to our oceans and to our land that we're not to be commended for by any means i mean i'm not telling anybody they don't know that they don't know but there's certain things that, you know, need to be taken care of more than others because there's no reversing it when it comes back. So I feel like that's success as well, mm -hmm. you know, and that's as a group, that's not me as an individual, you yeah. know, that, that as a group of hunters and fishermen, like, and you know, we all preach about it. Benny preaches about yeah. it and let's leave it better than we found it. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, Chris Whitman, Cabs for Clean Water, he preaches about it. He's doing a lot for us. You know what I mean? Like everybody needs to do something about it, whether, you know, you drive by on the boat, you see a balloon float and pick it up. Like mm -hmm. it's just the way it is, man. It, it sucks that it's like that. And it, you know, it's just, it's one of those things, you know, I think that's success though, is taking care of what we have for future generations. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the ultimate success for me, I think. Absolutely, man. Thank you for hanging out hey, and man, stopping on your way having, having a beer. It. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited about these shrimp in 
Greek salad. Yeah, man, come down to Tarpon. We'll, uh, we'll I'm coming down for real. Yeah, for I'm sure. I'm coming down for come real. On. So thank you for the time. No problem. Thank you, man. Hey guys, thanks again for listening to the Captain's Collective. I have one quick request. If you haven't already, please follow us on Instagram or Facebook. You can easily find us by searching captainscollective.com. It's a great way to stay up to date and see all the behind the scenes. Thanks again for listening. This is the Captain's Collective.